lovely to see you all this morning. And um, I think you've all had the email about how we're proceeding now that the restrictions have lifted a bit. And um, masks are now optional. I think what most of you seem to have been doing is wearing them while you were moving around and then taking them off and you sat down like you would in a cafe. That's fine, but it is entirely a personal decision. The most important thing is that we don't judge other people if they make a different decision to the one that we do. Same with social distancing. If you sit in the side aisles, that is saying you want to be socially distanced. So don't go sit right next to somebody in the side aisles. That's it, Stephen says, go away, go away. <laughs> um, if you go to sit in the middle, don't sit down next to somebody you don't live with without asking them if they're comfortable with that. And if they're not, don't be offended, go and sit a little bit further away. And I think if we do that, we'll all get on fine <coughs> as we go through this time. It's still quite difficult, isn't it? It's still quite difficult to know how to feel about things. Um, after the service, there will be coffee. We're serving it indoors today, but you may wish to come in after we've sung outside, get your coffee and go back outside to chat. It's, it's not a bad morning out there. So again, the more we can be outside, the more ventilation we have, the better. Those doors will stay open for all services at the moment. So if we do hit a chilly weekend, please dress accordingly. <laughs> so we won't be shutting the doors. <laughs> Just to remind you also that the Scarecrow weekend is coming up. Um, if you've had your Barabi news sheet this week, you'll see that there is an entry form in there. If anybody feels inclined to make a <laughs> Scarecrow for church, that would be brilliant. Um, just let me know if somebody's going to do that. And we also need as many helpers as possible over the weekend to be in church, to steward, to do various things. We'll have some stalls. We'd like to run some children's games, as we've done in the past. So um, the Lord Mary, really. It'll be a bit lower key than perhaps it would have been in past years because we are still moving our way back to normal. But we do want to do something, be here and be a presence. And welcome people in to see the fabulous new church interior. We'll probably move all the chairs out of the way so that they can see the space. So it's something to look forward to in a few weeks' time. Something else to look forward to, we have a wedding coming up, and it's a very special wedding because it's a church family wedding. There they are, sitting at the back trying to look inconspicuous. So, I published the bounds of marriage between Timothy Adrian Hall, his previous marriage was dissolved, and Helen Jane Ainsworth, single, both of this parish. This is for the third time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. You're all right, you're done. There we go. <laughs> Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from sin and turn to the Lord, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, <coughs> confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, 
the Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to, the to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wanted, wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had already eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who's come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again into the hills by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Amen. Miracles. It's, um, it's quite an interesting subject in our modern and scientific world and even Christians can struggle with the idea of the miraculous. Many, many years ago when I was first thinking about reader ministry, Peter gave me a little text. He gave me, um, I won't say whose Lent course, but the is Lent course from a certain diocese for me to critique. And the whole of this Lent course was about telling people that miracles weren't really miracles. It was about telling people that Jairus' daughter didn't really die, they just couldn't cope with the fact that she turned 12 and was becoming an adolescent. Jairus, um, Lazarus wasn't really raised from death. Mary and Martha just had to learn to let go of him. And such like nonsense. Well, I have to say, the pens were screeching across the paper when I did it. And I obviously passed the test because here I am. But people do struggle, they want a rational explanation for things. But actually there is a rational explanation for everything that is miraculous. The rational explanation is God. God is not irrational and he is the explanation. And the thing is, our entire faith is based around a miracle. The one where a man who has been brutally tortured and executed could be alive, walking around, talking to his friends and enjoying a fish supper three <laughs> days later. If you believe that, then the miracles that Jesus performed <clears throat> during his ministry and the miracles that his apostles later performed shouldn't be a problem for you. If you don't believe that, then may God bless you as you continue in your journey of faith. And if you have questions, please do come and ask them. Jesus' miracles were very often in response to people reaching out to him for help for themselves, 
or for the people they cared about. Sometimes people who were in the worst possible place. And sometimes people like the crowds he fed on this occasion facing a less serious problem. Sometimes, like the widow's son that he raised to life, he acted without anyone seeking out his help. They were always performed out of compassion and they were to show Jesus' authority over the natural world, over sin, over everything. And they underline not only his love for us, but also his understanding of our individual needs at every level, from the huge things to the comparatively small things like a wedding that ran out of wine or, or people not having anything to eat before they went home. But they were never common occurrences. The recorded miracles in the Gospel during the three years of Jesus' earthly ministry average out at about one a month. We know that not every miracle, not every healing was recorded in detail, but even so, miraculous intervention seems to be the exception, not the rule. When Jesus walked this earth, people still got sick, people still died, people who set out for the day without lunch still went home hungry. It wasn't a blanket, let's make everything all right for everybody. So what about now? What do we think about miracles now in our modern age? When we want something that's highly unlikely to happen, like, I don't know, getting a teenager to tidy their bedroom or whatever, we sometimes say, oh, not a chance, the age of miracles has passed. But is it? Certainly a lot of things that people a few hundred years ago, or certainly a few thousand years ago, would have seen as miraculous, don't seem so to us because we do have a lot more explanation. Science has opened up for us ways of seeing things and understanding the creation around us that previous generations didn't have. And that's actually wonderful. That in itself is, is a bit of a miracle, isn't it? You know, you watch these things on television when you can see the tiny and microscopic, you can see out into space, things that previous generations couldn't have experienced. But it would be a shame if that gift turned us away from seeing that there is still room for the miraculous in our world. A miracle, broadly speaking, is defined as an event that involves the direct and powerful action of God, transcending ordinary laws of nature, defying common expectations of behaviour. They often do involve the physical world, but could also be the way God works within us, a miraculous change of heart, we sometimes say. And although that may be easier to accept, it's still very powerful. In fact, sometimes it's the most powerful kind of miracle of all. Miracles don't always happen in front of a huge crowd. They don't always happen in the glare of publicity. But I suspect they happen rather more often than we think. When something happens that is an unexpected blessing, against all the odds, something that we had longed for, hoped for, prayed for, but feared could never be. We don't always know whether things have just turned out better than we could have expected, or whether God has intervened. But miracles don't have to be noticed to be real. Well, it's easy to talk. Can I offer any examples of what I mean? Yeah, I can actually. Some years ago, a lady, not a Christian in any but the most nominal senses, had facial pain and paralysis, and she was told that it was most likely permanent. Someone blessed with being a conduit for healing put his hand on her face and prayed. She felt a sensation of warmth, and the symptoms disappeared and had never returned. A child, very dear to us, was born after a last ditch experimental medical treatment which is no longer offered because, in the words of the professor running the trial, it doesn't work. And I'm still here, which might not have been the case, which may include a bit of the miraculous, as well as the excellent medical care I received. I can't prove miracles in any of those cases. I won't know for sure until I get to heaven. But I suspect that when we get there, we'll be amazed at the way God has intervened in our lives. So yes, 
miracles do still happen. Maybe you have experienced that in your life or the life of people around you as well. Although I do have to say as a word of warning, if you've got people coming for lunch today, I wouldn't rely on a miracle to deal with the catering for them. <laughs> you can ask, but I suspect not. The problem for us comes when we think about why God sometimes intervenes in this way and sometimes doesn't. In fact, more often doesn't. And I've certainly known times when the miracle I've prayed for hasn't happened, or when there's been a very very hard road to travel first. For every person who praises God for what they see as a miracle in their lives, there are many more wondering why it didn't happen for them. There's no easy answer to that, except to say, and to say very clearly, that if it doesn't happen, it does not mean that God loves some of us more than others. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care about whatever it is we're going through. And in the end, he doesn't ever fail us when we trust him. Even if we can't always understand why he does things the way he does, or sometimes why he doesn't do things that we'd like him to do. It's not for us to dictate how or when he should act. One day, we will see the full picture and understand what to us now may seem like a mystery and indeed may be a cause of considerable pain. But for now, look out for those little miracles, the little things that you can't quite explain why it's happened. If it seems wonderful, if it seems too good to be true, it's not too good to be true, but it may be too good to have been without God's intervention. See him at work in his world. See the things that he is doing in your life and other people's lives. And don't be afraid to ask for the big miracles. They may happen, they may not. But if we put ourselves in God's hands in faith and trust, then we know that he will do what he believes is right for us, what he knows is right for us, even if we struggle to believe it. And we also need to listen to all the times when God is asking us to be the channel through which his miracles are performed. Jesus fed thousands of people on that hillside all those years ago. But he did it by using the freely offered packed lunch of one small boy. Be that small boy. Amen. Let's stand there to declare our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So let's sing again now. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
over this Sunday. Lord God, your Son left the riches of heaven and became poor for our sake. When we prosper, save us from pride. When we are needy, save us from despair, that we may trust in you alone. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now let's go on to lead us in our prayers. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your servant James the Apostle, who we commemorate today. James gave up everything to follow your son, Jesus Christ, and was obedient even to his death. May we become faithful disciples in your service, like James. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving Lord, we pray for the rescue services in India, trying to locate people affected by the severe flooding following the rain. We pray for the firefighters tackling forest fires in North America and for those who have lost loved ones as well as their homes and livelihoods. Once again, the problems we have caused by our selfishness have worked to destroy the beautiful world you created for us. Help us, Lord, to cherish your wonderful world and to live our lives working for its restoration. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Lord, we ask you to bless all those striving to perform for their best results in their chosen sports at the Tokyo Olympics. Paul writes in his first letter to the church in Corinth, you know that many runners enter a race, but only one wins a prize, so run to win. Athletes work hard to win a crown that cannot last, but we do it for a crown that will last forever. May we strive, like Paul says, to run our lives to the best of our ability and strength in your service. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for all children, including those at Barrowby School, and for the teachers who are now enjoying a well-deserved rest. Lord, please help parents who may be struggling to balance work as well as childcare, and for those who cannot afford to take their children on a holiday away from home. We ask you to bless those who have to be isolated as they have been in contact with someone testing positive to the coronavirus, and for those struggling to keep shops and businesses open with staff shortages. May we all act with care and consideration to each other to prevent the spread of the virus and to protect those who are clinically vulnerable from harm. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for all who worship in this church and for all the other churches in the newly formed Western Group who are looking forward to a new incumbent, incumbent being appointed. May we be welcoming to the new ways as we move our churches forward in the vision of a sustainable church. We give thanks for all who work to prepare and deliver our weekly services, our church wardens and our PCC, making decisions for the benefit of all our congregation. We have exciting plans for welcoming children and young people back in September to learn about Jesus and for house groups to meet face to face again and grow in their faith and fellowship. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving God, please be with all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Help them to know that you will be with them through their pain and suffering and to discover the joy of knowing that you sent Jesus to die for us on the cross so that we may have life in all its fullness. Jesus was able to feed over 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two fish, may we too eat this living bread. As we heard from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, his power at work in us can do far more than we dare ask or imagine. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the souls of our loved ones who are no longer with us. May they find rest in your eternal kingdom. In a moment of silence, let us remember before God all those who have gone on before.
Holy Spirit, be with us and all we love this week as we go out to tell others the good news. We ask for your help so that we will forever bring praise to God. Merciful Father, accept your Jesus, for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father Amen. in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Say the grace to one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We're going to go outside to sing our final hymn now. It's Jesus is Lord and it's number 140 in the Hymns and Worship hymn book. So just gather one up as you go out and we'll go and sing. <laughs> 